Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. launched their entrepreneurial venture driven by a transformative personal journey sparked by her partner's terminal brain cancer diagnosed in 2018. Please welcome the founder of Soul Drive Yoga, Alex Sabag. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Alex Sabag from Soul Dive Yoga down in beautiful, beautiful California, which I'm actually going to be down there in June, down visiting Long Beach, but you're just a little bit more inland. Before we get into all that, Alex, introduce yourself. Where are you calling in from? Um, I'm Alex Sabag. I'm the founder of Soul Dive Yoga. Uh, the studio is based in Palm Desert, California. And so you actually mentioned that you're actually calling in pretty close from the beach right now. So where are you at right now? I am. Right now I am in Solana Beach, California, which is honestly where I intended to live. Um, I'm right on the bluff. I have a teeny tiny little beach pad that fills my heart and soul with so much joy. Um, And a month after I bought the beach pad, I got fired and ended up with a yoga studio in the desert. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about the yoga studio. What, what is it? Why did you decide to uh, get a yoga studio going? Uh, Totally. Um, I think any good entrepreneurial story uh, will lead with the fact that I didn't choose it. It chose me. Um, I've had a 20 year relationship with the practice of yoga, most of which was incredibly frustrating. Um, You can't tell right now, but I'm five foot 10. I'm very lanky. And if you've ever taken a yoga class, um, some things they ask you to do, I was like, my body doesn't do that. Right. (laughs) I'm like, good for you. You're a gymnast and you're flipping around here like an acrobat. Um, but I actually can't put my foot there. Right. So I hated it. I hated yoga so much. Um, and it wasn't until I ran the bank of America, Chicago marathon when I was about 29, this is coming up on almost 10 years ago. And my body just like kind of physically broke down. Um, it was like one of the best days of my adult life, but took a major toll. I actually like couldn't stop running the months following and broke my foot. Um, in Napa Valley, which had nothing to do with exercise. <laughs> and, uh, and, and finally just accepted the invitation to go to the neighborhood yoga studio with a neighbor of mine. And again, didn't like it. I did not have a good first experience. Um, it was not, it wasn't one of those things where I was like, oh my God, I get it. Like it's in my bones, right? It was so much resistance, um, but it was kinder to my body. It was this gentle, um, but also like intense form of exercise. And I was like, all right, well, I can maintain my physique and do hot yoga. And so I got addicted as so many do. Um, So it was just the practice for me was very, very much in the physical. Um, Fast forward, I um, was in a relationship six years ago and my uh, fiance was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Um, And it was through this experience that I say yoga's higher power really struck. Um, again, my history with it was very much a workout when really the practice of yoga is more of a work in, I don't know if you're a yogi, but, um, yes, we can like do a bunch of chaturangas and we can bring heat and we can bring power and strength and condition the physical body. Um, but that's just part of it. Yoga actually has eight pillars and the physical movements only one, um, after he was diagnosed, my house was kind of just turned, just totally transformed into, um, you know, this caretaking habitat, right? And it was kind of right, overrun right. by sadness and death and gloom. And the yeah. yoga studio felt my, like my respite, my home away from home. Um, I had no power, I had no strength. I would oftentimes just show up there and cry on my yoga mat because it was just simply a place where I could go and be in any way, shape or form I showed up. Um, and I share this backstory because it was really like all of these seeds started to get planted with Um, you know, my lived experience and my relationship with yoga and how it showed up for me and really the community and the people around it that offered um, this sense of uh, solace for me, not, and I I never received pity or 
oh, you poor thing. I mean, I remember the teacher that embraced me uh, the first time I went to the studio and she was like, look, this is, this is yours. You don't need to be any other way than exactly how you are. And I'd never really received that type of permission, you know, especially as like a woman and a business owner, this is my second business now. And, you know, we're expected to show up in a certain way and there was no expectation and no judgment and a heck of a lot of freedom in that space. Um, and it just kind of sparked my curiosity to understand why. And so I went through yoga teacher training as a way to, um, come back home, right. And rediscover my purpose. What am I doing here? You know, when you, when you go through any type of caregiving, whether you're taking care of an aging parent or a child, or I actually have an 18 year old dog, which is more work than, than <laughs> yes. I to admit. Um, you lose a part of yourself yeah. and it's okay. Right. I mean, we selflessly sign up for these things out of love and yeah. it is the most pure form of, of love we can give, um, in that self-sacrifice, uh, but I was really lost and I was really, um, it was kind of after this, you know, period of just like having absolutely no other identity except for that, which was kind of descended upon me through his um, diagnosis. Uh, I went to yoga teacher training and it sort of just like took off from there. I never wanted to teach immediately, you know, concluding the training, I started teaching. I never wanted to own a studio and fast forward, the pandemic pushed me out to California and I ended up with a lease in my inbox, right? Like just out of general curiosity. Um, so that's a little bit of the backstory. No, I love it. <laughs> I and I, and folks, just like I think, you know, what Alex is talking about in regards to the various pillars. Now, again, I've only been doing yoga for like about five years, so I'm, I'm kind of a newbie in regards to it. And I would completely agree with Alex, you know, I'm closer to the six foot. And so like, trying to stretch in these different, like the crow and these different poses for my hips. I'm a dude, my hips don't open like that very well, you know? And, and so, um, however, I will say like after that, after going through a couple of sessions and then like, you know, at the end kind of amaste, kind of feeling like really like a part of yourself and like breathe in like all some good vibes and breathe out the bad vibes. Um, that really kind of sets a tone for my day, you know, for me now I, Gentlemen, for those gentlemen that are listening, it's this yoga is not just a female thing either. Uh, my golf swing got better when I was doing yoga. I swear to God, I uh, got more flexibility out of it. Um, you just it, there's a lot a lot of benefits uh, of of yoga. I think that people probably really don't realize, um, and, and I think there's also this misconception that it's just a female only uh, kind of exercise. What are what are some of the benefits of yoga? Yeah. Well, first of all, I got to tell you on the whole golf swing situation, um, we have a yoga for golfers workshop. I'm telling this you, time, I know, <laughs> this isn't going to air in time to promote it, but if you can throw like, I'll hey, put on the newsletter. Like golf swing on Instagram and tag us. Um, it really does. I think there's, there, there's certainly the physical benefits. I mean, this practice is ancient, 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 ancient. Right. And it was never like the way that what the Western world has done to the practice is fine. We do what the Western world does. We took something that's super sacred and we made it a commodity. Okay. That's all right. Um, we've done it with a lot of things and, and the yes, business of yoga is different, but it does stand the test of time as far as, um, you know, what it's doing, mind, body, soul. Yes. It's opening up your hips. It's giving you more rotational, um, movement and mobility in your shoulders. It's opening up your chest. I mean, people complain about traps, right? Like we hold a lot of stress and tension up here. Yep. Well, our shoulders round forward because our chest is tight. So everything is interconnected in the body, which we all probably know by now, but we can't actually get the shoulders back unless we open up the front side of the chest and conveniently it is where the heart is located. So as we're opening up this, like the, the, the surface layer, right? Layer one, chest, collarbones, spread them apart, create some more space here. We're also giving the heart a little space to open up. And from an energetic perspective, right? We need to keep the heart open. We don't want to be the Grinch where it's closed and frozen over and we lose this ability to like feel our way through things. We could, and a lot of people go through life like that. Like, oh, I'm going to feel, I don't want to feel it. I'm going to go high. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it truly is like we work through it. We start in the physical and we go down into the subtle body. And you don't need to know. I always tell people, you don't really need to know how the sausage is made. You just need to show up and be open. Mm, right? I love it. Uh, and that's very much like what you're saying. Um, and as far as it being, you know, men versus women, thank you. First of all, men, um, 
for any like single, I am like shocked that men haven't quite gotten the memo that like, why don't you like go find a yoga community that you like if you're looking for a solid dinner date, right? Oh, there like, you go. Yep. Yeah. That's a great I mean, point. I'm not saying it needs to be a pickup joint, but like, hello. Yeah. Um, but also just like, you know, physically we're built so different. And when you find the right teacher that you really align with and, and can sort of settle into trusting them and kind of flowing through their classes, you're going to learn that it's not a one size fits all situation. My warrior one's going to look different than your warrior one. Men are naturally going to have a wider stance, maybe a tougher time clasping the hands behind the low spine and letting the, you know, bind kind of fall over the back of the neck. Um, that's all very normal. Um, and I don't, and I, I use normal lightly, but like we got to normalize the difference. Yeah. Yeah. We're not all going to show up in the same way, shape or form. And I think one of the biggest things that I've taken, um, forward to the mat from a teaching perspective is that freedom. Um, you're not going to come into my class and hear a lot of like, uh, alignment or kind of that clinical part of the discipline that's there. And there's a lot of practices that offer that and it's beautiful and it works for you. Amen. Go do it. Um, but for me, I love, um, just the freedom and the inspired creativity to really just like flow and get in your body. Yeah. And I must admit, you know, I'm again, I've probably been doing it for about five years or so off and on here and there. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned was like opening up your heart and they, I'm always hearing that in my workout and I've never under, truly understood what they meant by that. And so you're kind of giving that explanation is really nice. And it truly is like, again, you're just open up your body. And, and one of the things they constantly talk about in the class is like how everything's interconnected, right? Like it goes, it goes out from up from your feet, out through your head, right? And it's kind of like you have this aura, your Murakaba essentially, right? You're the flower of life all around you, right? And it's it's really, really nice to kind of go through that process. And again, gentlemen, I, I would really encourage you to try to do it. Um, I can touch the floor now, like when I can bend over and touch, like that is like, I can do it. <laughs> like that was a huge, huge step for me, but it, it feels really good. Now, Alex, I wanna kind of take a step back because you mentioned this is actually your second business. So let's talk yeah. about what was your first business and what, yeah. what happened with that and how did you transition to yoga? Yeah, well, first of all, anybody can touch the floor. You just, this is your permission is to true. bend your knees. Yep. Bend your knees. Okay, <laughs> save your low back, protect your joints. I, I was like, I have to put that PSA yeah. out there because it's like, it's like, just use your resources. It's not cheating. Um, so my first business uh, was a small uh, boutique in a PR company located in Chicago. So I went to school at DePaul University and never left the city and graduated early and right away started working for a big PR agency um, in downtown. Um, I left in October of 2010. I was 25 and founded AM Consulting with Susan G. Komen as my first founding client. So um, I took you know, this, this passion for, you know, writing and PR and storytelling and really wanted to focus on things that mattered. Um, what you'll learn very quickly about me is I can't fake it. If I don't like it, I'm out, right? Like it just, it's just how I am wired. Um, and the agency life just wasn't, I was promoting brands that I didn't, that I wasn't passionate about. I couldn't get behind. Um, and a lot of nonprofit missions, not all of them, right? But a lot of them I could. And the the business really started um, focused in kind of women's health. Like Komen was my founding. I went on to work with a group called Friends Apprentice, which is the, one of the fundraising arms for Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Um, and the business grew from there. I had, you know, at my biggest, a team of seven in an office in the West Loop. And, um, you know, what was interesting about it is I created a business that I was like, this is going to be great. I'm going to meet the man of my dreams. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a family and I'm going to have all this flexibility to be that badass business owner and a mom. I'm like, this is going to be great. Guess who got to do it? Not me, because I wasn't aware of all the freedom I had created at the time, but my number two, um, she was the director of media relations for me. She worked with me for, I don't know, probably eight years. And we got connected through um, just like a mutual contact. And when we met, she's like, I want to start a family. And I'm like, oh, fun. We could be pregnant together, right? <laughs> I mean, I would, like, the, that you, the blind spots you don't have. Um, but she went on to have two beautiful kids while working together. And it really showed me that um, you can do both. Yeah. Right? And, it's, and I have not um, gotten married or had children yet, but I hope to <laughs> someday. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was a good run. It just, after about 11 years, it was tired. Um, and I wanted to do, I wanted a new challenge and a bigger change. And 
I accepted a role with a startup that pushed me out to California, um, which was a bit short lived. And then I went to another startup for about a year and a half as the chief marketing officer as an insurance technology company and um, really got to flex my skill set while learning a new industry kind of like simultaneously And the startup world is whew, not for the faint of heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, but an awesome, you know, like an awesome feather in the cap, right? Like yeah. if you can hang that, if you can hang in that arena and especially being a, a young woman in the insurance space. Uh, no easy task, but ultimately, uh, that was the company that I got fired from while having the lease to the space that is now sold dive yoga, uh, in this all divine timing. Right. And you yeah. can, you can resist it and you know, like everybody listening, if you have something that is calling you and you ignore it, it is going to stay. Yep. You're going to hear it. You're going to feel the taps. Um, and I write about this actually in my book. There are some people who can learn by the subtle tap. I love you if you can. Good for you. I'm happy for you. I am a two by four learner, right? <laughs> Imagine the two by four, right there. Um, the one that like knocks Fair. you down and <laughs> takes the rug out from under you, and you're like, holy, why? Why so hard? It's like, we, we just like wasn't learning, right? Hopefully, I'm catching on a little bit to the subtle, but um, it's the same. It's in life and in relationships and in business. If you do not pay attention, of which yoga can help you pay attention. Um, cause it quiets you down upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'm not paying attention cause we can't hear. No. Yeah. It's we're annoying. constantly moving. And, and, you know, I was talking about that with the previous guests is, you know, our attention spans is, is individuals is continuing to get shorter and shorter and shorter. Right. Yep. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you talked about Susan G Coleman, you know, and that's, you also came from a very, it's very interesting because your background is the nonprofit world and it's in very you know, emotional in that area, you know, Susan yeah. G. Coleman was, you know, focused very much on the breast cancer world. Right. Yep. And, and those stories from those women's very, very touching and very challenging. Um, yep. and then having to transition over to yoga, which is again, still like to your, as you mentioned, touching the heart, really trying to help individuals open up their heart and not be in the Grinch. Right now, yep. how did you transition from building this brand of PR which is a completely different target audience to building this yoga brand. So at the root, it feels like the skill sets are largely the same. Um, you know, I was building a brand for other people in my kind of previous life. And when you talk about nonprofit, you're right. It's so um, hypersensitive in the way that everybody you're working with for the most part um, is so directly connected to a cause like lost the sister or a mother or a child or um and so those like real life moments um, are at the epicenter of the business. And usually when we talk about business, it's like, well, let's take the personal stuff out of it. In nonprofit, it is, it is directly related yep. to the personal experience. That's why the cause exists in the first place. Correct. Uh, there are a lot of parallels with yoga. I mean, I don't, yoga is not fitness. Um, you can exercise your body through the practice. That is true. Um, but where it starts to, starts to have a lot of parallels in that, and that cause is the deeply personal aspect of the practice, right? No two people show up on their mat the same way physically, nor do they show up the same way, you know, emotionally or energetically, right? Like nobody knew what I was going through when I arrived on my yoga mat in a pile of tears, right? I could have, I could have had a dumb breakup or like stub my toe, could have right. been a number of things. Didn't necessarily have to be like a terminal illness, <laughs> right? Right. right. From somebody that I love and we just don't know and and what happens um like through these movements and these postures uh is just it's kind of a lot of unexplainable movement of energy and that really is the purpose right we get stuck as people whether we're feeling or we're going through something or we're in this like growth phase and if we don't move through it we're going to get in this hamster wheel of complacency or boredom um, or a place we don't want to be, right? right. We want to be over right. here. And we don't know how to be over here because we're over here. Yep. And the only way to do it is just start moving, right? You got to move toward the manifestations so that the stuck energy can get out of the way and make the physical and energetic and emotional space for what truly is meant for you and your purpose. Um, back to the business part, branding is branding, right? What's your mission? What's your vision? What are your core values and what's your core product? Um, Defining that for yourself can sometimes be a little bit more challenging than doing it for others. Um, but it came really easily. I wrote the business plan, not to like toot my own horn, but in three hours on an airplane. And it was like, it just kind of came out and I was like, wow, all right. Um, I guess we're going to do this. Uh, and, 
and it just, it just flowed. But you know, the things that, you know, again, like it is, it's such a deeply personal practice. Uh, the challenge that I think all business owners would say is the greatest is the people. Yeah. Right. Yep. It, and good, bad or indifferent. Right. But it's like, when you're, when you're working with somebody is like intimate personal life and in a way yoga very much is, um, it's all custom. Yeah. There's very little rinse and repeat, like in those dialogues. And so it's, it's time consuming. Um, you can't automate that. It is, it's very like we lead from these wholehearted heart centric places because that's why people are coming to the door. Yeah. Right? It, yeah. It's all coming from the heart. And I think that's what you're going to see. And, and I think this is the theme that you're going to probably hear throughout this podcast, folks that are listening. Uh, this is not the first guest and it probably will not be the last guest that's talking about the need to really like when you're focusing on your 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 uh, target audience, really pulling out their heartstrings. What is what, valuable to them? Right. How to create uh, how to identify that value and then really exploit that value from a brand's perspective. Right. And that's so, you you know, Alex has mentioned the value proposition. Right. Great. Creating a value uh, proposition statement. Right. And making sure that you kind of lead by that. And, and because when yeah. people when people think about your brand, they also want to feel a certain way. Right. And I think yeah. that's exactly how you build it. And, and how what is your value proposition? Yeah. Um, so we, I'm just in the process now of revisiting, finalizing the mission statement. Um, cause it's different. Like the yeah. business model of soul dive yoga is different from most studios. Um, and I'm not quite ready to share all the details there, but I will tell you that the mission is to, we created a really beautiful space that is a very blank canvas. You could walk into soul dive and be like, wow, this would be a great art gallery or raw event space. You could have a beautiful dinner party in it. Um, and it's that way on purpose. It's not, um, it's not loaded with any like iconography or, uh, or a lot of imagery, right? It's, there's one wall that has my record collection on it. Um, we're a very music driven studio. And the reason for that is what we want is the, the community to come in for class or, or otherwise pick a record and play it so that the next person that comes in is like, oh, sweet. That was my song from whatever, my wedding or my parents' favorite song or whatever it is. So then they're connecting on something real and we're not reporting the weather. Yeah. Or we're in Palm Desert where the sun comes out every day. What yeah. do you do, right? I'm from Chicago and the sun never comes out. We don't need to talk <laughs> about it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, and so the space is just this really clean and clear uh, capsule. Right. And it's just, it's there. It's a blank canvas for people to come in and kind of move and create in whatever way they are inspired to do. But at the root of it, we've created a space where you can come as you are, any way, shape, or form to simply be. You don't have to move. You don't have to take the postures. You don't have to do 8 million chaturangas. If you laid down on your mat for the duration of the class, you did it because you got yourself through the door. You arrived and you took an hour for yourself without the outside world coming at you. And we've had people take us up on that. I mean, it's like, it's weird, right? Like I, I like the, if I were to show up for class and be like, mm, I'm gonna sit this one out, I'm just gonna lay here. Even I would maybe feel uncomfortable despite the fact that I have created a space to do just that. We want people to feel like they have a place to go. You know, um, the timing of this all, we opened on the heels of the pandemic, right? And I'm like over talking about COVID. So this is not a COVID story necessarily, <laughs> but what COVID did is took us out of connection and community. Um, and the ice, I personally, like I loved a little bit of the isolation. I was living in a big city. I was constantly on the go. I was like, thank God you've taken away my FOMO and I can just chill for a minute. But big picture after three years of that ish, um, we took people out of connection with each other and we are humans. We are meant to be in connection in community. We weren't meant to be isolated and doing it alone. Um, and so when studios say we're rooted in community, they mean it. Right. And different communities have different vibes, of course, uh, because of the people are one thing we can't control. Right. We set a vibe. We hold the space, you know, meaning that it is like a clear, beautiful container free of, you know, any like negative self-talk, the trauma, whatever. We keep that out so that it's just this pure capsule where you can come in and be just as you are and create and take whatever you need from the experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great, great point. Now, you know, you had a lot of experience, I think, within the entrepreneurship world. You have two different companies now. Thinking back on some of the difficulties, what would you say were some of those difficult 
the parts that you've kind of went through throughout your role that you're kind of glad you went through because it taught you a lot? It's a long list. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, I kind of came, I I rose in my career as a female business owner, um, which I'm, which I'm super grateful for because a lot of that I just kind of learned um, as I went. But I will say, because I started my first company when I was 25, um, when you then become the boss at such a young age, you lose your um, your mentors a little bit or your school, your the people who like are your checks and balances. Um, and so I had to make a conscious effort to continually find my mentors and the people that I felt would provide value to learn from. Um, over time, that has kind of evolved into business coach retreats, you know, different circles of like where, what tables are you going to put yourself at because you belong there, because you are enough, because you're capable, right? Getting rid of the imposter syndrome of, oh, I'm not good enough. Um, And actually like surrounding yourself by people that can really help elevate you and what you're doing. And then in return, you can do that back, right? Like women are, uh, there's a lot of conversation in the women business world where it's like, we need to adjust each other's crowns, not tear them down. Um, And I think just sort of navigating the space of like just finding the right tables to arrive um, so that we can, you know, we can kind of collectively rise and elevate is it's a challenge, but it's a good problem to have. I mean, it's a good challenge to have Um, people, right? Like when you look at scaling and hiring, um, we scaled quickly, right? Like I, I have, I had no desire to be in the weeds of running a yoga studio for years. I have kind of a bigger plan um, ahead of me and a book coming out June 16th. Um, so I brought on a studio manager in August and, you know, once you do that, it's like kind of open the floodgates of like, well, then we need this role and this role and this role and this role. It's like, oh my gosh, okay. (laughs) Like, how do you go through the process of getting the right, um, the right person in the right seat with the right scope and the, you know, and the right money and the, and the whole thing. It's like, I, I didn't have that experience in corporate America. Right. 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 I only scaled my last business. So so far. So it's like, it's really, it's like kind of assessing where you're at and then going and finding the people who do specialize in that and then putting them at the table too, to help you get there. Um, It always comes back to people. It does. I mean, people are the hardest challenge. It does. (laughs) I I, I feel like, you know, throughout this podcast, you know, we've been doing it now almost three years. One of the things I'm always consistently hammering home to the listeners is the importance of networking, right? The importance of building your network, um, finding mentors is, is super important. Uh, in fact, folks listening, uh, if there's a lot of mentees out there, I don't think there's enough of mentors out there. And I, I think that's because some people don't think they have value to give somebody, but I, I think you do. Uh, so folks listening, you know, I think there's a lot of people that you can actually provide a lot of value to, uh, you just gotta be willing to kind of put yourself out there as well, uh, because there's a lot of people asking for help as a mentee, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of mentors answering that phone. And so I would, I would encourage those folks to kind of dig deep inside of them, I think you do have a lot of value to add to a lot of these folks and, and just you know, go with it. You know, open up your heart, as Alex been said, right? Open up totally. the heart. Don't be a Grinch. Let's get no. out there. Back, put your heart open. I will say this. Nothing bad ever came over a 45 minute coffee. Yeah, I, I agree. You know what I mean? like, I, there is a, there is a stark difference between, um, I'm going to spend three hours a week with you and I'm going to spend 30, 45 minutes, like just sharing. Right. And there's, there's also a lot of great coaches. Um, I started working with a business coach last June and I, I, to say it was life-changing is, a, is a dramatic understatement, right? My expectations were like, okay, right, you know, maybe it's going to provide some value. Maybe not. I mean, I'm not necessarily like super dialed in on like numbers and spreadsheets. And so I think I could use a little bit of support here and there. I'll be honest, this woman opened up the floodgates for me and it would, it would like what I'm trying to do wouldn't be possible without somebody coming in a checking your blind spots because yeah. we all have them. And if yeah, you, you, you're like, you don't think you do, you got it. Just we're, you're in good company. <laughs> uh, and, and number two, it's like, we can, and this is, this was where it like, this was really the pivotal like business moment for me in the last six months. I can hack away at this and make this business successful. No doubt. Do I want to do it in 10 years alone and like just chip away and chip away and chip away? Or do I want to do it in two years with the right support? 
And like the, like the metaphorical visual, if you've ever played Super Mario Brothers and it's like Mario's going along, going along, he sees that tube. He gets in the tube and it's like, whoop, yeah. up he goes. <laughs> That's it, right? Like it's, it, and it's, you know, we, we talk about like investing in yourself and resources and, you know, are you funded or not funded and all those things. I mean, Soul Dive is created from scratch. Um, a lot of studios are like inherited or kind of change ownership. This was built literally from the dirt. And I funded it. And now I'm funding, you know, myself and the expansion of not only this brand, but others, because I'm investing in me. So um, that can be uncomfortable. I can tell you when I got the business coach on board, I was like, yeah, this kind of feels like a lot, you know, it's like, well, I, I think I'm worth it. If it was like, do I want to buy myself a handbag? I'd be like, oh, heck yeah. You know, yeah. like, who needs to fight? <laughs> When it's like, well, I want to, I want somebody to like sit at the table and provide value. We're like, mm, I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know why it was there, but I was like, all right, no, 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 I'm going to do it. I've been thinking about it. I'm going to do it. And that was just the beginning. I mean, the investment by the end of the, this like 2024 calendar year could be six figures in what I'm willing to put back in um, to like the bigger vision and the brand. And sure. I could say, well, I didn't go to business school. It's okay to invest the money now. You don't even need to make that excuse. You invest in yourself because it's your biggest asset. Yeah. It really is. And it's, I just, um, I have a byline column in Entrepreneur Magazine and my, and my first piece was about imposter syndrome. Oh yeah. And it's big. It's real. Yes, I think it like, forget COVID. This is the epidemic we should all be worried about, right? The self doubt and those nagging feelings. Like we can't do it and we're not good enough. You're good enough. If it's your purpose and you're approaching it with passion, you got it. It's literally, it's like your divine calling. If it's waking up in the middle of the night, it's not for nothing, right? Don't let it, don't let the two by four hit you in the head. Man, I always got people trying to run through a wall in this podcast. I love it. Right. Oh man, <laughs> yeah. but it's true. You know, it truly is true. Uh, I think uh, nobody starts at the finish line. You know, I talk about this often. Uh, everybody started somewhere, and in that imposter syndrome, too, really does kind of kill, uh, bring down your self esteem sometime. Now, one thing I'd also encourage you know, one thing I'm always asking folks is like how to properly pronounce your names. Um, that's also another important thing, especially when you're working with different ethnicities and, and you're different, especially if you're going global with your business. Pronouncing somebody's name and taking the time to really pronounce it is really going to help them become the better selves of themselves as well. It help, also helps you. Uh, it just kind of, you know, feeds into that, you know, that heart thing, right? Kind of open up your heart to help others. It really does. Now, one of the things, Alex, you also talked about, you know, five years and the, at the end of 2024. So first I want to talk about, and you, you mentioned it. I'm sorry about the thumbs up just came up, but I, you mentioned the book. It's coming out in June. Yeah. So first, what yeah. is the book about? Uh, tell us about the book and it's coming out in June. And then secondly, well, I'd love to hear about what's Alex's future looks like. Yeah, so um, the book is the book is memoir style and it really is rooted in my like lived life experience and the biggest two by four moment that I hope I will ever have <laughs> in this life. Um, it really all started with, it was on my 33rd birthday, my, my boyfriend turned fiance was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And at the time it's like, oh my gosh, like I'm losing the person I love my, you know, but really what was happening is the life I had dreamed for myself, this like perfect relationship and the beautiful wedding and building a family and living in a Lincoln Park brownstone in Chicago. I mean, it all of a sudden got lit on fire. Right. And we don't realize I didn't see that at the time, but it literally was my whole life burning down, not just like this small moment. Um, and so that's kind of how it starts. And it, of course, is like a little bit where I've come from and, and where I'm going, but it's largely rooted in that. And what do you do? Like what happens when, when that, when something that big, and it's not, it's not just unique to death, right? We experience a form of death all the time. I've gotten quite comfortable <laughs> with death yeah, over too, the yeah. years because I mean, we, look, look, we leave a party. It's a form of death, right? We're walking away. It's the act of leaving. And as humans, we love to overstay. We overstay everywhere, relationships, <laughs> jobs, bars, right? Like, I mean, we just do because we're so uncomfortable with endings because it's a form of death, right? And so I realized at the time I was so ill. I mean, I realized now I was so ill-equipped to deal with life 
I mean, everything that happened was like very real life. Now I was very young to experience it. It's insanely tragic. And it's like a story suited for a lifetime movie for sure. No doubt. Um, but it taught me a lot and it showed me that, um, I and many, many like me are resilient. It showed me that it's, you're never anywhere forever. I didn't know. I mean, I had about six weeks after he was diagnosed. Um, my dog also went on bed rest. So again, a dog, I mean, I'm telling you, right. It's like, and I remember the dog was like, had a neck injury. And so the dog had a neurologist, obviously the fiance had many neurologists and, you know, so I have the dog outside in this little patch of grass that was outside my building in Chicago. It was in the West Loop. So there wasn't a lot of grass, but, and I had gone down to my neighbor's house and made like a margarita or something. Cause I had to take all the alcohol out of my home. And I was like, all right, this I'm, I'm out here for a while. Cause the dog's going to hobble around. And I was sitting there and I was like, okay, I think I'm at the bottom. Like, I truly think that I could lose a parent and it wouldn't be this bad because what was like, really what was being lost for me was my future and everything that I thought I was going to have. And it was really sitting there and having the awareness that I was at the bottom, that I got to say, okay, like, here I am. Nice to see you. I know it's not going to be forever, but it is for now. And eventually I'm going to be on the other side. And I'll tell you, it launched literally a five-year process where everything that I attached to my identity my friends, my relationships, my community, my home in Chicago, my business burned to the ground, all of it. And it wasn't overnight. And it was like one little fire, 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 right? And it just all kind of happened. And it wasn't until literally my 38th birthday, which was this past June that I woke up and I was like, I think it all stopped. Or at least, you know, like the wave, right? Is over and I can look back with, you know, with a lot of gratitude, um, which I have found um, over the years, I will tell you, my fiance, former fiance died on September 14th, 2022, which was the day I got the keys to Soul Dive Yoga and took possession of the space. So there was, there was so like, we never know the seeds of our future being planted in certain um, instances, right? Like without him, going through like without us sitting in the hospital room and like hearing what we heard and then me going through this like process of being his caregiver and finding solace in the yoga studio and having all of these things kind of shift right like soul dive yoga was planted way before that lease dropped in my inbox okay and and it is for others too right it gets it doesn't nobody has to die like this is the good news like somebody did right and that's okay and I've processed through um you know a lot of those emotions and and kind of come out on the other side with a different perspective, but um, it doesn't have to go there. And in many cases, like, you know, people's story of heartache and heartbreak and those really tough traumatic moments, they're no different from mine, right? Like we all feel, um, and to take a page out of Brene Brown's book, which, which I love, um, she defines empathy as connecting to the emotion, underpinning the experience. And what was different then than, than it is now is like, then I was like, I'm 33, nobody, like nobody's like me. I am alone, right? You feel very isolated and like only 80 year olds are taking care of their six spouse, right? And here I was like 33 thinking I was gonna sooner have like take care of a baby, not um, the, you know, a guy. And now using that definition of, definition of empathy, we really have a greater ability to connect with people when we realize we're not alone. And that sadness and grief and heartache and, you know, those emotions are frequent. They come like they come in waves, right? Like every day. And it doesn't have to be centered around a death or anything. It can be for anything. Um, and a yoga studio is one of the only places you can go where you just like put all that on the floor, right? You literally can like take it from your hands and put it down on your mat and say, I don't want to walk out with this today. It might come back and then I come back tomorrow and I work through it again. Um, but it is a space where um, it's just, it's free of the expectations and the judgments and the shoulds or the obligation. It's like, th there's none of that there. If you're walking in with it, it's, it's like truly you and you got to leave it at the door and we'll help you do it. Um, but it's just a place where you can simply be and work through it. And that's what it was for me. And it really set me up to be able to hold the space 
for others to come in and have that same little mini soul dive experience, right? Their, their soul dive doesn't have to be a year and a half like mine was or, or five year birth phase, right? Um, it can be an hour class. We can take the pressure off and just work through it as we need it and, and like continue just to show up, right? All you got to do is come through the door. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally agree. Care of the rest. And in fact, totally. you know, that's uh, the, the hardest part folks is like showing up, you know, and, and I think celebrating those wins as well. And you, Alex, you kind of mentioned it too. You know, you can just come there and you don't even have to just showing up. You don't actually have to, you can just lay there, do dead man's pose and just take it all in for a while. Uh, I always love dead man pose after a nice, like, you know, 30, 45 minute yoga class. Cause then you're just like really soaking it all in and like letting it kind of, you're letting all of your juices still flow, but it's like a very calm relaxation. You're, you're really kind of finding time to fine tune with yourself and find purpose for your day. Um, you know, one of the things I actually created a 2024 motto, uh, it's, 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 I'm going to read it off to you. I put over my whiteboard. So I'm going to read it. It's embrace growth, <laughs> seek knowledge and lead with purpose. And so that's my 2024 model. And what really what I mean is one, I really want to embrace my own personal growth, right? As an individual, as a professional and is in, in my social world, right? Trying to build up that, but also continue to seek out knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. How do I continue to uh, be a better, you know, learn more by learning for individuals like Alex and, and other folks that bring on the show, but then lead with purpose, right? Uh, our voice you know, the strongest weapon we have is our words uh, and those, you know, the way we use them uh, with people and, and for people is very important. Uh, how we build each other up is very important. Uh, I truly believe that when we've fallen down the corporate ladder, somebody's going to be there to reach out and ca- catch you because those are the ones that you helped up. And so, you know, doing yeah. good for other people is always important. Now, Alex, you know, what what was, what's the next five years for Alex look like? Where, where are you going in the next five years? Where, where do you, where do you see either the yoga studio or the book? Where, where do you want to be? Um, well, the yoga studio is going to be a staple in the Palm Desert community for decades to come. I feel, I feel that it's, it's really rooted. Um, it's, it's become this kind of like sanctuary for globe trotters and locals alike which is a different type of community right usually we think super hyper local is a little bit more um like we're in a very we're on el paseo it's like the rodeo drive of the desert right so people find us and they come and they practice and so whether soul dive um stays just in palm desert or there's a possibility of taking it somewhere else um you know to kind of build that same type of community there I'm super open to that um, I don't know that that's my solo self-funded calling if you get my drift. So if anybody's listening to this and is like, oh, I'd love to infuse money behind that woman, hit me up. Um, as far as me, I, I, have been, I have been divinely called to share my experience um, in a bigger way. And so the book is the start, right? It is chronicling um, what I went through in many ways, right? Like not, I mean, not just the caregiver, although that was the, the awakening moment. Um, and, and so that will take me to bigger audiences, right? I mean, I can, I can communicate with a lot of people in the yoga room. I can communicate with a lot more at a conference. Uh, so I think, and, and without saying, put your right arm in the air, lift your left leg. You know what I mean? Like when we kind of take the, we can, we can certainly do some yoga, but then when we really get down into the storytelling and the sharing, um, you know, removing some of that cueing <laughs> might be helpful. Um, I am I'm seeing an amazing event in Santa Barbara in April, and um, I share it with you because it's it's like it just hits right, it just lands. It's called Sun Sender, and the headline DJ is Shalu. And if you don't know, do you know Shalu? Yeah, I do. Okay, yes. sick. So I like, I, I mean, I'm going to tell him this when I meet him, but I'm pretty sure the yoga community made him famous. I was going to say, I feel <laughs> like, like I've heard him in a yoga class maybe one time. A thousand <laughs> like percent. Or it's something. like it's vibey and jammy and whatever. I mean, I've been obsessed with him for a long time and he's going to be like, who's this weirdo? But um, so Sun Senders, um, Sun Senders mission is to really bring this idea of movement and community and celebration to the daytime. <laughs> so it's a 9 a.m. yoga class and the dance party begins at 10 and um, I'll be emceeing the entire event and I'm doing it with um, in collaboration with a dear friend of mine and owner of, uh, her name's Adrian Smith. She owns Power of Your Own in Santa Barbara. Um, she'll be leading the yoga and I'll be kind of keeping it moving all day. But that, I mean, that really feels aligned um, 
with me. So events like that, where it's, you know, the ability to share um, and inspire, right? Large groups of people. And then we can still all go to bed at 8 p.m. Because let's yeah. be honest, like I don't party at night because I literally can't stay up. Yeah, no, I, once it's like 9.30, I'm, yeah, good luck. Once the double digits, yeah. like the double digits hit 10 o'clock, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. So Alex, yeah. for folks that are maybe interested, maybe we have some folks that are listening that do in fact want to put some money behind Alex or maybe want to, maybe Alex decides a franchise one day and they're interested. How can folks contact you? What's the best way to get in hold of you? Um, you can reach me uh, at alex at soldiveyoga.com. Um, Soul Dive uh, has a website, soldiveyoga.com. My personal brand and website, uh, it's not quite live yet, but I will share it when it is. Um, at Alex Sabag on Instagram, at Soul Dive Yoga on Instagram. Um, or if all else fails, drop Mr. Gabriel Flores a note. There you go. Yes. <laughs> in, <laughs> in fact, this is a great time to plug the newsletter. All this information, all of Alex's information will be on the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. You can subscribe by visiting theshadesofe.com. You can always also follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, and you will be able to see this episode on YouTube when it airs. So Alex, is there anything else you'd like to let the guests know before we leave? I'm just really grateful you had me. So I appreciate it. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people travel to Palm Desert in the winter. So please come visit Soul Dive Yoga, whether you're out for tennis or Coachella or Stagecoach. Um, you know, we have a full schedule that's rocking 12 months a year. I love so, it. And I'm telling so you folks that sure. living in the living in the Pacific Northwest area after this winter, I think you're going to probably see a lot more people out there during the winter time because this winter kicked our butt. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> it was rough. <laughs> Alex, thank you again so much for being on the show, folks listening. Again, please follow us at theshadesofe.com or you can visit uh, all of our social sites. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.